Welcome to International Programs Alumni Week. Welcome to London at 50. We are so excited for this event and so excited and thrilled that all of you could join us for this event and for the events throughout the week to celebrate international education, to reminisce on our experiences studying abroad, and to also look forward and celebrate the experiences of students that will be able to study abroad in the future. Um, so that is my very brief welcome. I'm going to turn it over to uh, the stars of this show. So first, I'm going to turn it over to Katie, the assistant director in London, who is going to introduce our guest of honor. So take it away, Katie. Hello, everybody. Greetings from London. My name is Katie Beringer, and I'm the assistant director here at Florida State University's London campus. I am delighted to have this opportunity to inter introduce our speaker today. While the City of London and Florida State University have seen much change over the past five decades, the core values of FSU London remain our touchstone. Students with a passion for adventure, professors with a thirst to inspire, rigorous academics, and strong leadership at our helm. Since 1971, our London campus has been led by 13 directors, with names some of you may remember from your time here, such as William Bruckheimer, Charles Wellborn, Eugene Crook, Mary Balthrop, just to name a few. Now, while there's been a bit of change in the world from 1971 to 2021, um, our brilliant directors have always brought excitement, wisdom, and adventure to FSU London study abroad programs. Our recent alumni here will know today's speaker very well. Um, Dr. Kathleen Paul is one of FSU London's longest standing directors, having enthusiastically led our program since 2008. Dr. Paul's own background precisely encapsulates the impactful significance studying abroad can have in one's life. A native of Liverpool, England, she earned a bachelor's degree in history from the University of York before turning her sights to the United States, where she earned her master's degree and PhD in history from Boston College. Dr. Paul went on to spend nearly two decades lecturing at the University of South Florida. She truly represents the intersection of where the United Kingdom meets Florida. And she's always particularly excited to meet students from Tampa, her adopted American hometown. Her passion for both the United Kingdom and the United States resonates in her direction of the FSU London program, creating a welcoming and engaging academic environment that allows our students to become culturally immersed in their life in the UK. Dr. Paul ensures our students return to the US rich in the cultural capital they have cultivated during their time studying abroad. As our program director and as a professor of modern history, we can think of no better person to reflect on the past 50 years of our program and how Florida State University came to have such a strong academic reputation in London. So without further ado, I am delighted to now hand the Zoom call over to our London director, Dr. Kathleen Paul. Wow, thanks, Katie. That's a lovely introduction. I really appreciate it. It's very kind of you. Um, well, it is actually an absolute pleasure to be here today to talk with you all and share some thoughts and ideas about the past 50 years, the past wonderful 50 years for FSU London. Um, and it occurs to me that really we should start with congratulations, right? Congratulations to everybody who's been involved in making FSU London what it is today. It seems to me that it's only because of the collaboration, collective goodwill and teamwork of thousands of students, faculty and staff that were able here today to celebrate FSU London at 50. So congratulations to everybody for whatever part you've played in getting us here. But let's start with the most important people. Let's be real, our students. And I think we have a photo that Eddie, uh, one of our IT officer in London is going to share with us. And you can see in this photo, the first group of students in 1971, 40 women, 33 men, clearly full of excitement, full of joy. Now, some of them remind me of the optimism and the forward thinking that we see in so many of our students, right? Particularly if you look at that banner, it proclaims FSU London Study Centre. It has to be optimistic because at this point in 1971, the FSU London Study Center consisted of the Monarch Hotel in Cromwell Road, Earls Court. Specifically, and I think we have a photo, this is what it would have looked like, Cromwell Road. So this is the first home of FSU London. In the Monarch Hotel, of which we had sole use, I should say, we had classrooms on the, or rather classroom on the ground floor, 
We had breakfast served in the basement, invariably, I'm told, consisting of a bread roll, shredded wheat, one egg, and a piece of bacon. Current students and staff take notes. Future orders might be placed for different breakfasts. Um, female students were housed on the upper floors, with male students housed not too far away in Nevin Square. We've gone from separate houses to co-ed flats. That's possibly the first change I would note for the last, 70, uh, last 50 years. Now, while perfectly sufficient, the facilities at the Monarch Hotel were certainly of their time. Now, you've got to remember, this is barely 25 years after the end of the Second World War. And so we had a student who described that during his six months in London, he lived out of a suitcase because of lack of closet space in his room. He showered, mostly with cold water, in a makeshift flower shower room two floors below. But don't worry, the student reassured me that he was entirely satisfied with these provisions, far preferring to spend whatever time and money he had exploring his new city than wondering why on earth the British had not yet discovered the joys of hot water. Under the leadership of William Bruckheimer, as Katie mentioned, the first students and faculty of FSU London embarked on a whole new adventure, experiential learning, incorporating the physical and cultural richness of London into the academic curriculum. In short, they used London as a textbook. By visiting galleries, museums, sites of commemoration, theater performances, so much more. They brought London to life. They brought this textbook, they read it daily. And it was a textbook that was ever changing. Now, what did they mean when they first came to London? These pioneers, these 73 of 71, I like to think of them as a little group by themselves. 73 of 71, what did they meet? Well, the first thing we should talk about and I think Eddie has a photo for us here. It's coming up. Yep. I just, the Beatles. I mean, you know, they broke up. It's actually not at all relevant to the history of FSU London, but as somebody that has the great good fortune to call Liverpool my home, I just thought I'd mention it. Some of us are still crying tears today. Um, anyway, the Beatles went. What else did they find? Well, they found a new currency. Well, but you'd expect that, right? Because you know, they went to a new country. Except in this case, the new currency was for the British as well, right? In 1971, Britain introduced decimalization. Out went 20 shillings to the pound, in came 100 pence to the pound. Britain went metric. New coins, new banknotes, a new start. But the process was not without its complications, or at least I should say without its worries, particularly the British government, who were petrified that having minted 4,140 million brand new coins, all bearing the Queen's head, they were terrified that the Queen was going to die before they could get the coins in circulation. Now, I personally think that the Queen took this as a personal challenge and said, blow you for thinking I'm going to die young. And so I'm happy to say, as I'm sure all of us are, that the poor woman is still going strong today. And in three weeks, she's going to be 95 years of age. I think there's a few of those coins have gone out of circulation before our queen went out of circulation. Anyway, so with new decimal coinage in their pockets, what did our students encounter? Well, they were so lucky. In 1971, London was on the edge of change, the cusp of change. It was becoming a wonderfully, beautifully diverse city. Earl's Court was full of Australians. Brixton was full of West Indians. Uh, Camden Town, Kentish Town, full of the Irish. Uh, Shoreditch, East London, full of South Asians from India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. These were all British subjects who came to Britain to live and work. Famously, the very first of them came on a boat called the Empire Windrush. You know what? I said boat. My father worked on the ships all his life, and he was very, very keen that I remember the difference between a boat and a ship. This, my friends, is definitely a ship. The Empire Windrush. And so you've got 492 Jamaicans coming to settle 
live and work in London. Now, we also, at the same time, had half a million Irish people coming over between 1948 and 71. And all told, we had about a million people from elsewhere in the Commonwealth coming to live in Great Britain. But it was pretty much a one in, one out game. Because just as one and a half million people came into Britain between 48 and 71, so did one and a half million UK citizens leave Britain, like these two happy families here, extremely fertile, as you can see. They've both got a baby to take away to Australia to build a brand new life in the new world. So right on the edge, this is, this is London. This is what our, our students, our 73 of 71 met. How lucky were they to be in the midst of this multicultural, just growing, multicultural, multi-ethnic, beautifully diverse city. Lucky too, honestly, let's, be, let's face it, because not only did they have this new city and new friends to make, better food started to appear on British plates. So that was a definite plus. Now, as if a new London was not enough, a few years later, our students met a new Europe. In 1973, the United Kingdom joined the European Economic Community, or as it was known then, the EEC. They did so despite having 16 years before declined to join on the basis that being a part of Europe was eh, not really the British thing. Plus a chance, right? Anyway, let's go back to 73. What was the European Economic Community? Composed of nine nations, it was a celebration of post-war peace and prosperity, bringing together old enemies such as France and Germany, destroying the memories of Hitler and Mussolini, establishing a European identity, an independent European identity to stand between the superpowers of the United States and the Soviet Union, working together to raise living standards across the bloc, and more generally laying the groundwork for a prosperous, collaborative, international European future. So Britain in 1973, as you saw there on the newspapers, it was a giant, big, capital letter, yes, we're in. Those were the days, my friend. Whatever might have been the aspirations of the European economic community, however, peace and prosperity at home in the United Kingdom in 1974, when one group of students arrived, were a little harder to find. Thanks to a labor strike, oil shortages, the reignition, the reigniting of one of Britain's oldest pieces of colonialism, it was certainly unusual times in which to land in London. That first group, for however, that first group, for example, they went without their clothes for a few days because a baggage handler's strike meant that their luggage took a vacation to Italy. And the day after they arrived, the Irish Republican Army announced their presence by detonating a bomb at the Houses of Parliament. So unusual times. Fortunately, things got better. And our students were able to enjoy, or at least endure, some of the oddities of life in London. The selling of ice creams during the cinema break struck one as unusual. Standing up to sing the national anthem at the end of the movie. Eating fish and chips soaked in salt and vinegar and served in newspaper, drinking beer at cellar temperature, wondering where all the water fountains and the ice cubes had gone, watching coal be delivered by horse-drawn carts, and perhaps most British of all, being stunned by the really unique British preference for shiny wax paper toilet roll. Of all these curiosities, I'm delighted to say that only the soggy fish and chips and the warm beer remain. We have moved on in some ways. Now, of things British, a few years later came the biggest celebration in years. Queen Elizabeth celebrated her silver jubilee, 25 years of being on the throne, a fabulous spectacle of pageantry and patriotism across the whole country. The activities surely would have attracted the attention of our students. Were they at the roadside waving as the Queen drove by? Did they write research papers about the role of the monarchy? I'm sure they went to see plays about the monarchy. Admittedly, maybe not Elizabeth II, but surely Henry V, Hamlet, King Lear? They would have got involved in a lot. For my part, I remember 1977 and the Queen's Silver Jubilee. 
because I won a chocolate orange in elementary school. I made the best kind of triangular witches, dunces, amazing red, white, and blue hat to celebrate the Silver Jubilee. And as my prize, I won, I came first place, and I got a Terry's chocolate orange. I've always enjoyed chocolate oranges since. But still, our students continue to come. Some of here would have been in 1979, when UK politics took a complete turn to the right at the election of Margaret Thatcher. The only politician, by the way, to have an era named after her, Thatcherism. An era that took Britain to the right, um, sort of disabling the state, rolling back the state, a focus on private enterprise. Here she is with the Queen, possibly discussing what was to come for the future. Or actually, I'm not sure, that might not be the right photo, Eddie. It might be the next one that you want to show. Yeah, that's it. So there you've got Mrs. Thatcher and the Queen. Well, anyway, you figure out what's right. Driven by Mrs. Thatcher's vision, the 1980s in the UK became famous as a period of excess. In the financial services sector, there were huge exorbitant bonuses for people working in the city. In fashion, we had shoulder pads, leggings, big hair, leg warmers, we had everything. And of course, in television, over 20 million British people asked themselves, who shot JR? Truly, we were on our way to a global village. Now, a soap opera of a different kind took a plot twist of its own in the summer of 19, or in, rather in February 1981, when Lady Diana Spencer and the Prince of Wales got engaged and married within six months, and they began their own rehearsals for the crowd. Now, there's a lot I could say about this, but I think I'd rather just leave it with the idea that perhaps the ending to this particular storyline was foretold when one of the betrothed, in answer to the question, are you in love, answered, whatever love is. To which I think the group Foreigner, three years later, surely wrote their hot, uh, top chart hit, I want to know what love is. I think Charles should have had that played at one of his anniversary celebrations. Anyway, leaving Charles and Di to get on with the business of making an heir and a spare, the only real job of the royal family, FSU London moved its story forward by two steps. One, appointing a permanent director in the shape of Dr. Charles Wellborn, a World War II veteran with a bronze star for heroic achievement. Not much to live up to there then and second by moving into new premises. Situated in South Kensington, across the street from the Natural History Museum, the Queensbury Court Hotel was growing up in the world. Now the picture here clearly says Onslow Court, but we take it from here that this is an example of what we would have seen of the kind of hotel that our students would have moved into. It was a definite upgrade on the monarch. And we know that because it boasted three classrooms, one faculty office, one administrative office, one small kitchen, and wait for it, the latest technology. One overhead projector and screen, one radio cassette player, one slide projector, one video cassette recorder and TV, and don't get overwhelmed, two electric typewriters. It was perhaps just as well the faculty still practice what had always been the ethos of the program, teaching best by incorporating the streets, statues, and squares of London into their syllabi. Now, who were these um, faculty? Well, we had around 10 each term at the time, and reflective of the US faculty body, they were mostly male. Interestingly, they represented not just the very best of Florida State, but the very best of the state of Florida. And as we see on this map that we're gonna look at from Eddie here, you can see that FSU London drew on faculty from across the state, the whole state university system of Florida. So we had people from FSU, USF, UF, FAU, UNF, and more besides. They were teaching in disciplines such as history, theater, literature, humanities, art, all the better to make the most for the students of being in the very heart of London. Now, by this point in the mid 1980s, this program length had shifted from six months to four, and the student body had expanded to include students not only from Florida, but elsewhere around the states, places such as Indiana or Pennsylvania. 
not encouraged, however, were freshmen. Explicitly, the marketing materials made clear that junior, maybe sophomore, were the best years to come. Notwithstanding this prohibition, however, the London program continued to grow in numbers, moving from double digits in the 1970s to triple digits in the 1980s, even reaching a high of 209 students in 1988. So what, 16 years, 17 years, and we've got 209 where we once had 73. Remarkable growth. Now, the high level of interest confirmed that FSU London was here to stay. There would always be faculty and students ready to take advantage of the opportunity to study in what many, including myself, considered to be one of the greatest cities in the world. Now, perhaps they were driven by the fame of the museums, the pageantry of the royal family, the richness of the architecture, or maybe they just wanted to find their soulmate. Because what better place to find your soulmate than traveling overseas, getting lost, missing the last train from Paris to Amsterdam, and spending the night on the cold, hard concrete or tile of a station platform as you wait for that first morning train. Nothing creates love than that. And we have one example of that. Of our many matches made in heaven, oh, sorry, made in London, um, one person wrote in that without my time in London, I would never have met my partner. I wouldn't be messaging you from our home in the English countryside. We wouldn't have rescued a beautiful dog named Rory. FSU London gave me the life and family that I have today. And I will be forever grateful to FSU London. Now, with such happy unions and ever increasing interest in the program, it was clear that FSU London needed to find even more of a permanent home. The hotel was great. The new hotel was even better, but we needed more. Our students demanded and deserved more. And so after a great deal of research encompassing huge swathes of London, our very own Dr. Pitts found the perfect place. Situated in Bloomsbury, a neighborhood famous, for its cult educational, literary, and cultural associations, and with a rich history of its own, Thanet House, or as we know it, 100 to 103 Great Russell Street, was followed swiftly by the addition of 98, 104, and 99, and became the permanent home of FSU London. And you can see it there in all of its glory. 104 is just off to the left, or my left, so it has the sort of brick upper half, but it has the um, of gold lower half and then you can see uh, 99 has the placard above it proclaiming it to be 99 and then 98 is right next door. Now whilst in my mind the most important residents of Great Russell Street were and always will be our students, it's fair to say that the house has some tales of its own to tell. For example, it housed Lady Diana Beauclair. Lady Diana Beauclair was the wife of Topham Beauclair, who we will see coming up in a moment. And we will see these two lived in Great Russell Street in the late 18th century. It's a brush with royalty for FSU because Topham Beauclair, a man of letters, was the great grandson of Charles II. So who knew we had royalty at home? Of equal importance though, was Lady Diana Beauclair, or as she was known before her second marriage, Lady Diana Spencer. That's right, Lady Diana Spencer. We had living in our home an ancestor of the more recent Lady Di, an ancestor who was just as determined to live her own independent, adventurous life as our more recent Diana. Unhappily married, she famously became pregnant by her lover while still married to her husband. Oh, I should obviously make clear there that I'm talking about the Diana Spencer of the 18th century, who left her husband, Bolingbroke, to marry her lover, Beauclair. Just in case we're all being recorded, let's get clear uh, what we said. Now, with such a history to preserve and protect, there was a huge job for FSU London to take on, to protect to cherish and to restore this beautiful building, whilst all the time making it fit 
for the needs of our 21st, 20th century students. How do we do it? Well, one example, we had a dining room with 17th century wood paneling with gold leaf trim. What did that become? Well, after careful restoration, it became a Wi-Fi enabled conference room with beautifully restored 17th century Norwegian wood paneling with gold wood trim. We had a drawing room with an intricately carved paper mache ceiling. After our transformation, what did it become? A smart board classroom suitable for 40 students to study mathematics in with a beautifully, delicately, expertly restored paper mache ceiling. So as you see, we did our very best to preserve the heritage. In fact, I know that we preserved the heritage whilst we also created 26 flats, 15 offices, 16 classrooms, a couple of student lounges, three computer labs, a library, a laundry, and what else in between. Serving our students now while preserving the history of the people of the past. That's our mission, and that's our continuing objective to achieve. What about the neighborhood? What about where it was? Well, obviously I've already said, it's a literary, cultural, educational hub. Bloomsbury has proved an ideal home for our students, faculty and staff. It's a few minutes walk from the treasures of the British Museum. It's a stone's throw from the theaters of the West End. It's a step away from the glory and majesty of Trafalgar Square, the shops of Oxford Street, the politics of Whitehall. It is slap bang in the middle of the tube map. It's a cornucopia. It offers our students a cornucopia of choices as to what they might do on any given Saturday afternoon. And bearing that in mind, it is once again that I turn to Dr. Pitts and I proffer my gratitude for his decision to buy seven 17th century townhouses in Great Russell Street. A decision which, according to one US faculty member who had the very good fortune to teach both in Kensington and in Bloomsbury, he noted, and I quote, the wisdom of the FSU administration in purchasing the Great Russell Street property has proved to be a stroke of financial genius. I doubt very much if the program would be half as successful today had it remained in South Kent. Indeed. Now, so strong was Dr. Pitt's commitment to FSU London, that in 1993, he oversaw the renovations whilst also teaching a course on the program. As you can see him there in this photo, just at the front in the ever loyal garnetish jacket. Now, weirdly or bizarrely, remarkably, also in London that summer was a student who would go on to play a vital role in the development, not only of FSU London, but international programs, ultimately becoming IC, IP director. And that's Louisa Blenman there. Also, you can see her over to uh, well, rather colourfully, I should say, right slap bang in the centre, in the corner of the room. Um, Lou also had the forethought to dress in such a way that it would make it easier for me some 25 years later or so to be able to point her out. So again, my thanks, Lou, for that and for so much else. Now, the transformation of the centre from uh, seven 17th century townhouses into one academic uh, center was supported in the first instance by two permanent directors, um, Dr. Bert Atkins and Dr. G. Crook. And it was Dr. Crook, renowned for his serving of homemade chocolate chip cookies to the students, something I'm afraid I have never quite managed to achieve, um, who led FSU London into the 21st century. And he did so with ever more students coming. In 98, for example, FSU London hosted 489 students. Fabulous numbers, right? Reflecting the growth and the, not just, it's not the growth that I'm so pleased about in terms of numbers, it's the growth in terms of breadth of offerings that now so many more courses, right? Um, so many more innovative cultural programs, taking students all across the country. And also a different kind of faculty member. During the 1990s, faculty from Tallahassee were joined by faculty from London faculty with specialist knowledge of the city, which they called home year round. Instructors were able to bring a cultural richness of their own experience 
to mix with the uh, experience of professors from Tallahassee. And this combination of London and Tallahassee faculty has continued to this day. It's a mixture designed to provide students with the best of academia from both sides of the Atlantic. Now, by the year 2000, in addition to ever increasing numbers at FSU London, Britain had something else to celebrate. To mark the millennium, London built a giant Ferris wheel on the banks of the Thames near the Houses of Parliament, and they built this, the so-called Millennium Dome, which will actually play quite a big role in the future. In fact, in about a week's time, we will have 29 students climbing that dome. Who would have thought that back in 2000? What a remarkable time, right? The year 2000, the switch from one century to the next, from a century which began with the first, first powered flight to a century preparing for bases on Mars. Our students were there right at the cusp of change. Which one of those students won't remember today exactly where they were the year the century changed? Now our alum also likely remember the nationwide celebration surrounding the Queen's Golden Jubilee just a few years later in 2002. Street parties, a plethora of pageantry and fantastic fireworks all marked 50 years of Queen Elizabeth II on the throne. And I've got no doubt that our students were once again in the thick of it. I remember it, of course, mostly because I didn't get a chocolate orange that year. So we're just 30, I must say, I like this photo because I like the fact that it takes the queen through her four ages, right? We can see her as a young child with her sister and her mother. And then we see her stepping into the spotlight and saying, this show is all about me. And we see her on her own as she approaches her golden jubilee. And this particular postcard is from the Pitcairn Islands, which I've chosen to illustrate the idea that the queen at this point is still head of a commonwealth of nations, as well as uh, the head of state of the United Kingdom. So with just on 30 years of history behind them, our students still have 20 more to go. What happens next? Well, two people, two individuals who will play a significant role in FSU London enter the scene. One, Michelle Seesai, the then director, uh, associate director of international programs, took a particular interest in the management of FSU London ensuring financial stability, efficient use of space, student safety and security, while all the while mentoring staff on the ground. The second, Mark Wheatley, a playwright of renown, conceived an idea with Jim and Michelle, which building on an existing successful program and relationship with the School of Theatre in Tallahassee gave birth to a whole new entity. Theatre Academy London, or as we affectionately call it, TAL. Through TAL, FSU London opened up two of its greatest assets to other US schools. First, our local theatre faculty, all active professional theatre artists who were receiving rave reviews both in the classroom and on stage. And second, our premises at Great Russell Street, a permanent academic presence in the heart of London's West End Theatre District. Under Mark's direct leadership as director, and with the support of the School of Theatre in Tallahassee, TAL has grown in the past decade or so from around 20 students a year to over 100 students a year. A remarkable five-fold increase. Notable too is that those students, the program doesn't just grow in numbers, it grows in breadth. Today, in addition to three separate theater programs from Florida State, six other national US universities have integrated a semester in London into their undergraduate curriculum. And now they call FSU TAL home. And their students, they call themselves Seminoles for the semester. Now by 2008, the program had settled into a healthy rhythm. Six permanent staff, 15 or so local faculty offering 20 or so courses each fall and spring, and around 20 faculty coming over from the US to teach in the summer, many of them leading what we called special programs back then, 
or curriculum focused programs, programs which allowed students to come over in their major. So disciplines such as art history, global sports management, choral and instrumental education, and later communication, communication science disorders, psychology, and Harry Potter, possibly one of my favorites, I confess. Um, now, speaking of new programs, international programs had initiated another one back in 2004, an innovation which by recruiting freshmen instead of the traditional juniors, really turned study abroad upside down. Now, having worked with the 817 freshmen who since 2008 have called London their first university home, I can attest personally to the benefits of this program for students, faculty and staff. Arriving straight from high school, the students transition to the greater academic, of rig academic rigors of university, whilst within the liberal arts college atmosphere of FSU London. Working with faculty who have the time to mentor them, provide copious feedback on their work, being provided pastoral care by staff who care so very much for them, attending to every administrative detail while also being there every time a student raised their hand to ask for help. For my own part, I confess that when they were younger, my own children sometimes wondered how many siblings they had. So readily did my students' names drop off my tongue. Now, by 2012, the FYA programme and FSU London at large was thriving. But of course, in 2012, it wasn't only our students who were interested in London. The whole world was, as London played host to the 30th Olympiad. Now, in addition to the remarkable and completely unexpected number of medals that Britain won that year, the Olympics is possibly best remembered for the Queen's debut as a film star when she joined with James Bond to jump out of a helicopter at the opening ceremony. Well, at least that's how it appeared to me that she jumped. Spectacular stuff, right? Now, the Queen, we've got to admit, she's probably in a really happy mood because 2012 was also the year of her platinum jubilee. 60 years on the throne. There had been speculation that maybe Britain would combine these two wonderful events, the Jubilee and the Olympics, with one great, amazing Jubilympics. Turned out the Queen, rather like one of her ancestors, was not amused and demanded that the day be kept to herself. And what a day it was, a flotilla of over a thousand ships and boats, including one involved in the evacuation of Dunkirk in World War II, came sailing down the Thames. A, a fabulous spectacle, hundreds of thousands of Brits hundreds of thousands of individuals um, lining the banks of the River Thames, craning their necks, hoping to see a glimpse of the Queen and her family. What matters to me most is that among those thousands were about 20 of our students who had gotten up at 4.30 in the morning that day, determined to get a good spot to view the parade, or rather the flotilla. They were a particularly hardy bunch. Why? Well, not only did they get up at half four in the morning, but the government and the royal family, having planned every inch and every minute of this day, had failed to plan for one thing, the weather. Or at least they planned for good weather. In the event, it rained. It teamed it down. Cats and dogs, call it what you will. It rained solid all day long. Our students, having spent several hours waiting in line, running to get coffee to keep themselves warm while the flotilla passed, got soaked to their skins. And more importantly, or rather less importantly to me, I should say, so did the Queen and Prince Philip. Now I can't attest to what effect the rain had on Philip and Elizabeth, but I can confirm that the rain did nothing to dampen the spirits of our students, who soaking wet still, returned to the center full of excitement and enthusiasm because they had just participated in the greatest flotilla, the only flotilla for the last 350 years in London. What a memory. How about that for taking it home? Now, in fact, 2012 stands out to me particularly for four reasons, I suppose. Not only because I shared in the excitement of the early rising flotilla watching half-drenched students, 
but because I remember the unadulterated joy of securing Olympics tickets for our global sports students. I remember the switch from two six week semesters to three four week semesters in the summer. And I remember 2012 as being the first time that FSU London broke the half century barrier in terms of student numbers. Now it's clear to me that the last of these was undoubtedly in part driven by the third of these. By reducing the time and financial cost and commitment required for shorter summer programs, facilitated greater economic, demographic, and discipline diversity amongst the student body. A gold medal win all round and surely worthy of an Olympic year. Now, continuing this commitment to open study abroad to as many people as possible, in 2014, we had the uh, start of spring break programs. Again, a 10 day experience right in the middle of your class in Tallahassee, you get to come and spend your spring break on an academic excursion walking all around London. Now, some of you may remember, moving closer to the present, that it's the mantra of the current admin team in London that students should embrace the difference. Be adventurous, explore, immerse yourself in your new home, become a Londoner. Now, this type of cultural capital is not easily acquired, right? It comes from a hundred thousand different negotiations day by day with living with Londoners, Londoners living in the city, whether buying stuff off the market, whether traveling on the tube at rush hour, students bit by bit become Londoners. Bit by bit transform themselves from undergraduates on a study abroad program to Londoners. And in so doing, they turn an undergraduate experience into a life-changing experience which in creating globally conscious citizens translates an individual benefit into a collective good for all of us. Now our story is nearing its conclusion, but before we get there, just one more couple of points. Can you say that? Never mind. We turn our attention to the students of the past six years who between them have witnessed a referendum on the breakup of the United Kingdom, a breakup which had it happened a few years later, would undoubtedly have been called Scotsit. They witnessed a referendum on the withdrawal of the United Kingdom from the European Union, a move known more popularly, or depending on your point of view, unpopularly as Brexit. And they watched an autonomous decision by Harry and Meghan to withdraw from the royal family, a move known universally as Mexit. Now, for the Scottish part, things were tight. Suffice to say, the Scots have always wanted to be independent. The English have always wanted to invade them. 800 years of this, but by 2014, we have a strong pro-independence political party in Edinburgh, and we have an unpopular conservative party in London. The polls were tight. From absolute confidence that the union would stand, people in London and Scotland and Edinburgh, Glasgow, Liverpool, Manchester, wherever, but particularly in Westminster, people started to think the unthinkable. Scotland might actually leave. They might actually say, thanks for all the Taurus, but we're done. And the once United Kingdom would become a little less united and a lot smaller. It was an, a, an amazing time to be in the country. I remember welcoming students in 2014 and telling them that they might be the last group of students who were gonna to go to Edinburgh without having to show their passport. I remember teaching a course on British history and assigning a research paper about Scotland and England, which for, during the writing of which, the majority of students went from, well, Scotland will, will never leave. Scotland is just like a part of the UK. It's gonna stay forever. By the end of it, most of them thought, why didn't they leave years ago? It was just, I cannot tell you how exciting it was. Now, in the end, of course, the union stood. 55% of Scots voted to remain, 45% voted to leave, all was safe. Allegedly, the queen, when told this news, was so happy, she purred down the line to the prime minister, David Cameron. Now, for his part, Cameron, perhaps buoyed up by the success with this referendum, decided two years later to have another one. This time, it was gonna be a referendum on the United Kingdom, in the European Union. 
there had been a vocal right-wing element within the Conservative Party demanding that Britain should go. Cameron called the referendum, convinced he could win. What could go wrong, right? A lot, some might say. With 52% of the population voting to leave, 48% voting to stay, the decision was made. On a margin of 4%, the United Kingdom decided to leave the world's largest, one of the world's largest trading blocks to go it alone. Except it didn't end there. For the next four years, the UK population engaged in a most uncivil war. Some hoping for a second referendum to produce the right result, others hoping to build a wall at the White Cliffs of Dover, and others holding their noses trying to find something in between. In the end, we left December the 31st, 11 o'clock in time, 2020. A departure, I want to point out, that means that FSU has been in London longer than the United Kingdom has been in Europe. Let's repeat that. A university dating back to 1851 has greater staying power than a nation when it's in its modern carnation, incarnation calls itself as dating back to 1066. Not bad, my friends, not bad. Now, with 49 years completed, FSU London stood ready to celebrate its 50th year in 2021. Before it got there, however, came a virus which changed the world, a virus which robbed so many of so much. I want to give a shout out here to our current students, our Spring 21 students, who followed in the footsteps of those brave and hardy souls of 1971, and 50 years later, decided to come to London. I salute them all for their determination, their patience, their flexibility, their academic achievements, and their sense of adventure. Nobody knows better than our current students that we are all a single human race sharing a single planet. And yet still we look forward. Yesterday, I was looking at uh, courses in 2022. 2022, the year of the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. I'm sorry, I think I said platinum earlier. I meant diamond for 60. Platinum Jubilee for 70 years on the throne. It's an achievement unmatched by any other monarch, not even Queen Victoria. Elizabeth has outlived Victoria. She now is the front runner to become the longest ever serving monarch. We don't know yet in what way the Queen will mark the occasion, but doubtless it will involve plenty of Union Jacks, bunting, and maybe for some, the odd chocolate orange. However it goes, I look forward to seeing how our students next year respond to the right royal giveaway of a four day weekend. And I've got no doubt that about 20 of them are gonna get up half hour in the morning, head to wherever the parade or flotilla or flyby or whatever the Queen has come up with to see the Queen go by. Or then maybe I'll buy some raincoats. Um, after Elizabeth, what's next? Well, her mom lived to 102, so it's possible she might live a bit longer and celebrate 80 years as Queen in 2032. But whether she does or not, I've got no doubt that just as FSU London outlived Britain in the EU, so will FSU London still be standing to welcome Charles III, William V, George VII, and whoever else might be the next great-great-grandchild of Elizabeth. I tell you who that won't be, though. It's very unlikely to be Archie or a descendant of his sister. It's unlikely to be a descendant of Archie or his sister. Thanks to Megxit, and the alleged current state of war between Harry and Meghan in the US and the rest of the family in the UK, and following the entirely unscripted conversation with Oprah, it seems far more likely that faced with the prospect of having to put a descendant of Harry's on the throne, the UK Parliament will become a republic. Let's see, there's something to think about. Now, I began our discussion by thanking all those past and present who created, shaped, and grew FSU London into what it is today. Confident that FSU London will be here for many years to come, I want now to extend my thanks to all those students, faculty, and staff of the future who will, I know, take care of this little piece of Florida State in the heart of London with love, loyalty, and dedication. And just so that we can really understand exactly what they're looking after or what they will be looking after, I'm gonna share a little video which takes us into the heart of FSU London as it is today 
and will tug at your heartstrings as every one of you remembers what it is like to be there, to be in South Kensington, or to be in Ells Court. Because remember this, no matter the building, as beautiful as Great Russell Street is, FSU is a belief. FSU London is us. FSU London is all of those people who have contributed to it in the past and all of those people who will contribute in the future. The buildings are marvelous, but in the end, it's all about the people. So on that note, we're gonna take a look into the current heart of FSU London. Happy birthday, FSU London.
Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, everyone. That, um, oh, I watched that video yesterday and it's like bringing back all of my study abroad memories and just feelings of being in London and being in the study center. And Kathleen, that uh, presentation and discussion about the history of FSU London and the history of London and how connected they are just really means the most. It was incredible. Thank you so, so much for that. Before we um, move back um, over to Kathleen for some Q&A, we do have some announcements and some um, comments from our associate director here in Tallahassee, Lou Blenman. So I am going to briefly turn it over to Lou, and then we will come back if you want to stick around for some Q&A with Kathleen and uh, the folks in London. You are welcome to stick around for that as well. Thank you, Hannah. Um, uh, my name's uh, Louisa Blenman. I'm the associate director uh, here in Tallahassee. Um, I was uh, a student in London, like many, many, many of you, and um, found this to be particularly nostalgic and rewarding and enjoyable. Um, I, I really appreciate Hannah and her team for putting together our Alumni Week um, events. This is the first time that we've done this, and uh, I think that uh, on the back of the success of this one and the one we've already done in Florence, uh, it will not be the last. Um, Kathleen, you'll be pleased to know that we had over 100 people at one time on, on this. So, so far, you've got the record. Um, Kathleen might be a little bit competitive. So um, anyway, I appreciate Hannah and her team for, for putting this uh, together. Um, I'm really grateful to Kathleen uh, and her whole uh, London staff. Um, as you can imagine, this has probably been the hardest year uh, in the history of FSU London and, and probably in the lives of many of our, of our colleagues. Um, and they've done an amazing job of continuing our, our uh, legacy in London and I'm grateful to them for that. Um, I can't wait to be together again to see all the spit shining that has happened in London uh, when, we, when we had a very trying um, almost year without any students there. So I know our colleagues worked very hard to, to get us uh, ship shape so that when our students came back in January that um, it was everything that they deserved. Um, I wanna thank uh, the rest of our um, staff and faculty colleagues um, uh, here in Tallahassee, I see a fair number of folks who uh, are currently uh, teaching or, or on staff for us, as well as a few um, retired colleagues um, who, uh, whose shoulders we stand on. So I appreciate all of that. And, um, and of course, as Kathleen said, um, I'm grateful to all of, all of you alumni who have paved the way, paved the way for where we are now. Um, I absolutely loved seeing all of your, your sort of check-ins with celebrity sightings and dates and trips and concerts and um, all the other things. I, I, would, I would love to be able to gather with all of you and, and perhaps learn of some of the, uh, the, the um, anecdotes and, and antics that uh, you probably didn't want to put in writing, but I'm sure are just as, as uh, formative in your, uh, in your lives. Um, as these. Um, and, and that leads me to our current students um, who have shown so much uh, in, in the spirit of FSU strength, skill, and character. Um, I'm so proud of them for their determination and their resourcefulness um, in finding the best of London, even in the midst of a pandemic. Um, they've done us proud, and I hope that, that they, uh, like all the rest of us, have had a life-changing experience. Um, one of the things that, that the pandemic has, has provided is, I think, a, a few silver linings, and, and one of those um, has been uh, campus partnerships, um, where we've, we've all had to be creative in how we how we operate, how we connect with one another, how we um, serve our students. And um, one of the, um, one of the uh, I think most fundamental uh, changes that we've made or built on um, has been our relationship with the Career Center. Uh, we've worked closely with them. They've identified 
um, uh, uh, one of their uh, colleagues who is the point person for international programs, uh, Lee Pond, and she actually also happens to be a Panamanian, so that helps with the connection. Um, one of the things that that I'm I'm pleased about as far as our our offerings for our alumni um, is um, a way for you to connect with our current students to help them. Um, you you have so much wisdom and learned so much from your own study abroad program um, that we have. Uh, or they, the Career Center, has created a new designation for international programs. So if you uh, would like to become a professional mentor, you can, you can specify that you would like to be paired with uh, an IP student or a student who's interested in studying abroad. Um, and, and that can, can be a really good way for that student to connect with an FSU alum who's had a path that may be similar um, to, to yours. Um, the, uh, the next, I think, thing that we've, we've all learned um, uh, to, to do better and to be better uh, with is, is communication and social media. Um, we've had to rely on, um, on the internet, as has everyone else in a pandemic, for our primary means of communication with our students, with our alumni, with our faculty. Um, and I think our social media teams, um, both here in Tallahassee and our colleagues abroad have done a great job of, um, of keeping people connected. Um, I think uh, the, one of the most recent things that stands out to me, um, Katie Beringer, who's on this, this call, one of our colleagues in London, um, posted, as I'm sure many of you saw, posted in the London alumni group, um, many of our uh, end of term photographs uh, of, of our various groups. And, and I know people got a big kick out of that. So if you're, if you're not, um, if, if you are on Facebook or on Instagram and you're not connected with our alumni um, groups, uh, reach out, maybe, um, Katie, if you could put the name of them in the, in the chat, then people can, can search for them, if that's actually how that works. I, I'm, not a, I'm not an expert in social media. So um, the next um, area where we're, we're, um, we're trying to do a better job, as evidenced by this, is keeping, getting and keeping connected with our alumni. Um, of course, we, we have much better data and information on our alumni for the last um, 15 years since the onset of social media, um, but I'm thrilled to see um, many, uh, many folks on this call who are uh, from uh, pre-2000s, um, I love to see the 2000s too, but, um, but that we have managed to stay in touch with some of our folks from earlier decades. Um, and one of the things that we have tried to do um, in the last few years, obviously COVID accepted, is find ways for our alumni to work with us and to, to, to contribute their time and talents. So we have um, alums who may have um, reason to be in, in London for business um, or may live there or may have family there or may just visit. And we love to have visitors come to the study center. Um, and we, one of the things I really am fond of is having alumni present guest lectures or serve on panels, um, talk with students so that mentoring could be face-to-face. -face. So if, if that's something that appeals to you, um, I would encourage you to reach out to us and, and let us know um, how we might work together for our students to, to connect with you and to, to learn with you. Um, we also have worked very closely with the foundation. Um, they, they've been very supportive um, in a lot of ways, and most recently with the Great Give. Um, I know uh, some of you were, were able to, to donate to IP. We had two IP uh, Spark campaigns. One was for scholarships, which is our sort of typical go-to campaign for the Great Give. And then the second was to support our, our operations at our study centers. Um, as I'm sure you're not surprised to know, uh, it has been uh, a challenging year financially to go without students um, 
for uh, basically three semesters, um, two and a half semesters. And um, so we are appreciative of those who are at, a, at a, a point and have an inclination to provide any support, whether it's to our students or, or in other ways. I see a couple of our foundation colleagues, uh, Mafe Brooks and Larissa Trigg are on, on this call. And you'll see there, we have the contact details of Sarishni Patel. Um, but again, I, the, the, the most important thing I think is our connecting with you. Um, and, and there are many ways that, that we can keep that up and to serve you um, and, and for you to be part of our support of our, our current and future students. I actually saw on that note, one of the, the people on the call has, has said he can't wait to do his FYA year in London. So I'm assuming that we have a prospective or a future FYA student um, on the call. And, and I think everyone else on the call who has been a student in London would pat you on the back and tell you that that's perhaps one of the best choices you could ever have made. So well done. We look forward to having you. Um, with that, I think I'll turn it back over to, uh, to other folks to handle our, our Q&A. Thank you, Lou. Um, so a few um, just notes before we do jump into that Q&A. We're getting some questions in the chat about a, uh, a recording. Yes, there will be a recording of this lecture. You will be able to relive all of those warm feelings from everything we just heard. Um, that will be available on our YouTube channel. Um, we A lot of folks are asking, so we may send a follow-up email that includes that link, but it will be about a week or so, so it won't be super immediate. Um, but you will receive a follow-up email after this that has some of those notes from ways that you can continue to engage with international programs and continue to be involved with what we are doing in support of international education. Um, but with that, I do want to turn it back over, or open it up for some Q&A. Um, being mindful of time, we did say it would be about an hour. If you need to leave, you are more than welcome at any time. But we do want to create some space for some Q&A if folks would like. Um, so I am going to allow y'all to unmute yourselves if you'd like to, or an easier way would certainly be just to put your question in the chat and we can read it out loud and have Kathleen or someone else from the London staff or whoever is appropriate answer that question. So. Um, I'll go ahead and let you unmute yourselves if you'd like to, um, or again, you can put your questions in the chat. Or oh, I'm happy to talk for another hour. I say that in jest, of course. I really appreciate everybody um, listening and everybody being here today. Uh, it's just a complete joy to look back over the last 50 years and you know, to stand on the shoulders of those who've come before us and all that. And you realize what a hard job and what a great level of uh, commitment they showed in getting FSU London going and the students that just made it so worthwhile. It seems to me the study abroad is not um, a, okay, uh, a job that you fall into. It's a job that you choose based on the fact that mo so many of people who work at FSU London or in IP have themselves studied abroad. And they know firsthand the excitement. And I too cannot wait to welcome our next group this summer. We have I don't know if you want to pick out some questions that you think might be appropriate. Yes, sorry, I was reading through. Um, so we have a couple that um, I can answer super quickly, and then some that we might pass to you. Um, so we got a question about um, an estimate of how much our programs cost now. If you're interested in learning more about our programs, the best place to go is our website. That's international.fsu.edu. We offer a wide variety of programs in different locations at varying lengths. So all of those, all that information about costs will vary depending on the program. So you can definitely check out our program listings on our website. Um, we got a question, Kathleen, this would probably um, be Kathleen or Lou. Um, what is the situation of US travel to the UK now? Right now, um, US citizens can come and visit in the UK. They will have to take a pre-departure test before they leave the US. They will have to buy a travel test package before they depart the US, which will mean that when they're quarantining for 10 days in the UK, they take a test on days two and eight. And assuming that both of those tests are negative, they are then free to leave quarantine 
and immerse themselves in the absolute joy of Liverpool. Sorry, London. Um, a follow-up question to that. Someone else has asked um, what life has been like for students now. Are they able to go out and explore? So maybe talk a little bit about what they are able to explore when they are done with their quarantine. Absolutely. Uh, when our spring students came, we had 10 days of virtual activities, uh, community building, and we've continued some of those activities since. So we've had um, painting parties with um, students being guided through by a professional artist as they paint their way through trees, uh, all the while enjoying the very best of British gin or wine or other uh, exceptional British talent, such as also Marmite. We had students eating Marmite. So we've we, what we've done, I suppose you could say, is we've it, there is a limit. There has been in the beginning a limit on our students being able to go out into London. And so what we did was we brought London into our centre and our students have built community and built relationships whilst also discovering all of the many delights and sometimes the not so delightful aspects in terms of food anyway of London. Um, right now they're able to go out and about. They've always been able to go out and explore London, um, staying out all day, getting takeaway coffees. Um, they're going out now in larger groups, having picnics, uh, getting to see the very best of London. And on Monday, we're going to have the full opening of retail shops, of uh, gyms, of outdoor theatre, outdoor events. Uh, we'll be taking our students down to Brighton and the Seven Sisters. We're going to be standing there on those white cliffs saying goodbye to Europe, maybe. Um, we're also going to go to uh, Avebury, one of the largest prehistoric stone circles in Europe. We are going to go to Oxford, one of the uh, wonderful sort of dreaming spire cities of academic education. And our students, and I really am so proud of our students for their flexibility and patience. I'm not going to pretend it's been super easy for our students. They have faced challenges as things have changed. Government guidance has changed. But they have been patient and flexible. And they're one of the um, most rewarding groups of students with whom I've come into contact in my time at FSU. We have some similar questions. I think they're, um, your, your last answer kind of answered a little bit of these questions. We have some questions about what you think the difference is um, or the, exp the expected changes and effects from COVID will be in the upcoming years. Um, but I think you just shared a little bit about that. I don't know if you have any other thoughts on it as we wait for some more questions. I think that it will, I think COVID, and it, it is hard, but I, I agree with Lou, there are some benefits, right? It's our job as humans to find the silver linings where we can to take the benefits um, from the ills, if you will. And I think the connections that people have made, including our students, through the likes of this media here, Zoom or Teams or whatever it might be, these online platforms have brought people together in a way that just wasn't possible before. You had telephone calls, you maybe in the last few years we've had FaceTime, but you can sit now and teach your students as though you're in the classroom. And so it means that going forward, if a student misses a class because they're not feeling well, or they miss a class uh, because their plane is delayed, we will be able to have that student participate in the class as if their plane had arrived right on time. And that kind of connection, the integration of the internet resources into the classroom, remarkable, right? That we can use um, all of these resources to continue to bring history alive. Do I think that it will forever replace face-to-face -face teaching? I don't, but I think it is another tool that will enhance the teaching that in London, I believe is best done uh, by walking around the city and discovering London for yourself. And that is something that our current students have been doing since the day they came out of quarantine, exploring London, making it their own. Who does the best takeaway coffee and sandwich? Where are there enough benches to sit on in groups of six? Where, what do you need to take out with you, no matter what day it is? An umbrella, right? This is London. It's not about going inside the shops. London is living history. 
and that remains as true for our students today as it was back in 1971. Thank you, Kathleen. I think your your point about how we've been able to grow from this situation and how using technology and getting more comfortable with those types of things will absolutely benefit our students in so many ways in terms of accessibility and everything that you said. So thank you so much for those notes. Um, it doesn't look like we have any more questions. So thank you so much to everybody who has attended. Thank you for joining us for Alumni Week and wanting to celebrate international education. Reminisce on your own experience and hopefully connect with some folks that maybe you haven't uh, connected with in a little bit. But definitely please keep an eye out for that follow-up email. You'll receive lots of information on ways to stay in touch. We really hope that you do. Share your memories with us, share your photos with us. You'll get all of that information in that email, but we would love to hear from you and to stay connected with you. And finally, thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Paul, for sharing your thoughts and for um, this incredible event. Thank you so, so much. My pleasure. And I'm always happy to talk to anyone or email anybody who would like to spend a minute, an hour or a day talking about FSU London. Thank you so much, everyone. Enjoy your afternoon and enjoy your evening, folks in London.